pa nung campus. Natirati sa bahay pa natin Pinangarap ang lahat Umaawit pa sa hangin Amoy araw ang bulat Manila, a depiction of poverty in the Philippines. On one side, there are towering skyscrapers and economic prosperity, while on the other side, people scrape a living by eating discarded food, making cemeteries their homes. An invisible wall of air divides this place into heaven and hell. Every early morning, the people in the slums would go to the garbage dump, sifting through plastic bags filled with kitchen waste to find pieces of meat that still appeared edible. They would use their noses to judge if the food had gone bad, sometimes even taking a bite to taste. If they found decent fried chicken, they would collect it carefully. They would take some of the fried chicken home to feed their children, while another portion would be sent to a mysterious place. Here, the fried chicken would undergo a quick rinse with water, and then be boiled in a pot. In this way, kitchen waste would transform into a highly sought-after commodity on the shelves of the slums. There are many slums in the world, but there is only one like the Manila slum, where they maximize the use of kitchen waste. To us, eating actual discarded food already seems unimaginable, but that is just the tip of the iceberg in the Manila slums. The Republic of the Philippines, commonly known as the Philippines, is located in Southeast Asia. The geography of this country is quite intriguing, with a territory that comprises nearly 7,000 islands. From a satellite view, it appears as a submerged nation. The land is fragmented, much like its history of nation-building. Around the 14th century, various indigenous tribes and Malay immigrants established several fragmented kingdoms in the Philippines. The most notable among them was the Sultanate of Sulu, which rose to prominence in the 1470s. In 1521, Ferdinand Magellan led a Spanish expedition that reached the Philippine archipelago. Through trade and warfare, the Spanish gradually conquered the local kingdoms and colonized the Philippines for over 300 years. On June 12, 1898, the Philippines declared independence. However, in the same year, the Spanish-American War broke out, and the Philippines became a U.S. colony. From 1942 to 1945, during World War II, the Philippines was occupied by Japan and became a Japanese colony. After the war, the Philippines once again became a U.S. colony. It wasn't until July 4, 1946, that the Philippines finally gained independence. Due to the Philippines' vast number of independent islands, it is challenging to develop industries and economies in the spaces between islands. If development is desired, it must take place in larger plains and more favorable locations. Manila happens to be such a place, blessed with advantageous geographical conditions. Consequently, Manila was designated as the capital of the Philippines and began to focus on economic and industrial development. Today, it has become a highly modern and prosperous city. However, alongside the rapid economic growth and modernization, Manila has also witnessed a growing disparity between the rich and the poor. According to a report by the World Health Organization, Manila has a population of approximately 18 million people, with 36% residing in slums. The fact that one-third of the population lives in slums is a concerning statistic. Walking alone near the slums, especially at night, carries a significant risk of being robbed. If you are a female, the consequences can be even more severe. Discussing the law in front of impoverished people seems futile and absurd because poverty often breeds violence and crime. However, the reason why Manila's slums have gained notoriety is due to a type of food called pagpag. -pag. The term pagpag -pag loosely translates to dust off or Shake off. Yes, just as you imagined, it involves shaking off the dust from discarded food and then consuming it. Late at night, outside a fast food restaurant in Manila, workers dispose of the day's food waste into black plastic bags. At midnight, the garbage truck arrives slowly, and sanitation workers collect these black bags, taking them to the waste segregation center. Around 3 a.m., 
the designated location receives the food waste. The eager scavengers, who have been waiting anxiously, rush towards these black plastic bags. They know that if they hesitate for even a second, the chance of someone else grabbing the meaty chicken legs becomes high, leaving them with nothing. The competition here is fierce. Her name is Zhou Shi, and she has been doing this job for 19 years. Nineteen years ago, Zhou Shi was fired by her company when she got pregnant. After giving birth, she had no choice but to take up this job due to financial pressures. Calling scavenging food waste a job is a reluctant description for Zhou Shi. Today, Zhou Shi's harvest was quite good. The fried chicken with meat was overflowing from the paper container. After finishing her work, apart from taking some home for her children to eat, a portion of the fried chicken would be sent to other places for further processing, and the chicken bones could be sold to a farm. On average, Zhou Shi earns around $3.5-5.6 per day, but a lunch meal costs her 70 cents, almost a quarter of her daily income. At Zhou Shi's home, there are three children gathered for the meal, including one of her own and two others who have lost their families due to unfortunate circumstances. During mealtimes, Zhou Shi invites the two children to eat at her home, doing her best to help them. Even in such a life, Zhou Shi continues to use her meager income to help others without seeking anything in return. Poverty hasn't changed Zhou Shi's kindness, but kindness cannot change her poverty. Now let's shift our focus to the small vendors who prepare Pag Pag. Zhou Shi sells a portion of the meat she scavenges to these vendors. After receiving the meat, they rinse it with water and sell it directly. This grandmother has a more advanced method. She separates the larger pieces of meat, cleans them, and then refries the recovered meat in oil. Another method involves stir-frying the recovered meat in a sauce to enhance its flavor. Initially, the grandmother despised making pag-pag. She believed the food was unclean and could make people sick. However, for the sake of survival and after neighbors told her that washing the food would make it safe to eat, she started selling Pag Pag. Nevertheless, she tries to make it as clean and hygienic as possible. In the slums, low-cost meat is highly popular, and a bag of recovered meat can be sold for about 30 cents. After deducting the cost of purchasing the recovered meat, the grandmother can earn around $4.2-7 per day barely meeting the conditions for survival. Indeed, the World Health Organization has issued warnings to the local government in Manila, stating that consuming pag pag can lead to various diseases. However, despite the nominal regulations in place, the government has taken little to no action to address this issue effectively. The grandmother has been saving money to send her children to school. Although there are public schools available in the area, the additional costs and miscellaneous fees associated with education make it difficult for children in the slums to pursue their studies. In the slums, children make up two-thirds of the population, and there are a staggering number of them. Women are often among the victims of violence in the slums. There are many cases of women becoming pregnant as a result of rape, but they are compelled to carry the pregnancies to term because the Philippines is a predominantly Catholic country with 83% of the population practicing Catholicism. According to Catholic teachings, abortion is not allowed for women. Due to the lack of free family planning resources provided by the government and the inclination of the poor to have more children, even in the slums, there is explosive population growth. With the rapid increase in population, the already limited space in the slums becomes insufficient. As a result, cemetery slums have emerged as a solution. Due to the uneven economic development and rapid population growth in the Philippines, coupled with the fact that it is a multi-island nation, the wealth gap between people has been widening. As a result, many people flock to the capital city in search of job opportunities. However, even the capital cannot provide sufficient employment opportunities, despite the increasing influx of people. Consequently, more and more individuals find themselves unable to secure jobs, leading to the proliferation of slums. The initial intention of people coming to the capital was to find work and earn money, 
hoping to move to better living conditions and gradually achieve a better life through their own efforts. However, the reality is harsh. Although Manila has experienced economic growth in recent years, this wealth has little to no connection with the people living in the slums. Most slum dwellers have low levels of education and can only engage in low-paying jobs in the city. Their meager wages can barely meet basic survival needs. With more and more dream seekers arriving in the city, combined with the rapid growth of the slum population, an even poorer segment of the population emerges, surpassing the poverty level of the slums. Those who arrive in Manila later and cannot find a place in the slums seek opportunities in more distant areas. The nearby cemetery, not far from the slums, has become their new dwelling place. According to statistics, from 1986 to 2014, over 6,000 families were living in cemetery communities. They build makeshift shelters above the concrete coffins. Once they find stable employment, they upgrade these makeshift shelters into more permanent structures, resembling the slums. The public cemeteries bury individuals from the lower strata of society who cannot afford traditional burial plots. The lease term for these burial sites is five years. After five years, the old graves are cleared to make room for new remains. Marla is a professional gravedigger in this area and has been doing this job for 20 years. The cemetery here is quite large, providing daily work opportunities. For graves like this one, clearing four of them earns Marla around $3.80. He admits that when he first started this job, he was disgusted but he persevered for the sake of his livelihood. This is an expired grave. Marla picks up a hammer and breaks the surrounding concrete, then sets aside the tombstone. Finally, he pulls out the remains from the grave. Marla contacts the relatives based on the information on the tombstone to collect the remains. If no one comes to claim them, he gathers these remains and cremates them. Many recently deceased individuals are waiting to enter this area so the storage time is limited to five years. Marla handles the remains with extreme care, fearing to disturb the deceased. He has had nightmares more than once, which makes his feelings about this job indescribable. As night falls, the usually tranquil cemetery area becomes lively due to its residents. Young people bring speakers and more and more people gather as the music plays. They drink and dance right next to the vast expanse of the cemetery. The reverie continues until late at night. When the sunlight once again illuminates the earth the next morning, the events of the previous day in this area feel strangely surreal. The cemetery area, which should be peaceful, has taken on a subtle atmosphere due to human habitation. Despite the hardships of life, the faces of the children in the slums still beam with smiles. They are happy at this moment because they are unaware of the challenges they will face as they grow up, unaware of what the outside world is like. Their destinies are tragic, predetermined from birth. Due to the continuous expansion of the cemetery area, the government is preparing to clear the area. When this topic is brought up, Marla becomes worried as he doesn't know where he will go. But no matter where he goes now, his body will eventually return here.